Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Healthy Aging Lecture. It's 11 o'clock right now. I just want to let you know we're going to give it just a couple more minutes to let folks hop on, um, but we will be back and get ready to get started in just a few minutes. So, so hold tight. All right, let's get started. So good morning again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this month's Healthy Aging Lecture. Um, we're gonna be focused on cardiovascular health this morning. And I'm gonna introduce our speaker in just a moment. I want to remind all of you, in case you're new or just uh, are returning, about a couple housekeeping tips for our uh, presentations, our webinars. We have a question box and we definitely encourage you to use that box to type in your questions um, for our speaker today. We'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation and we'll, we'll take as many as we can. Um, in addition, this presentation is being recorded. So everyone who registered will receive a, a link and you're welcome to listen to the recording again or share it with, uh, with somebody you know. So um, just have that in mind. And then with that, I'm going to um, go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We are really happy to be joined by Priya, Dr. Priya Simlot. She is um, a cardiologist here at Virginia Hospital Center. She joined in 2022. I hope I have that right. It sounds about right. Um, and she practices general cardiology and imaging. She also has a special interest in women's heart health as well as lipid disorders. And just reading through her bio, she also has a bunch of other interests and specialties. So we'll let her get into that a little bit more. Um, but Dr. Simlo, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you to um, get us going. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking on, as part of the Healthy Aging Lecture Series. What better time to talk about cardiovascular health than February, since it is Heart Health Awareness Month? Um, so today we'll be going over some general guidelines about cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular risk reduction, um, and some lifestyle tips that you can use at home uh, to prevent uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so just a basic outline of today's discussion. I wanna start first with defining what exactly is heart disease. I think it's a generic term that people kind of use, um, um, you know, a, a lot without, um, uh, you know, really understanding what it means. And so we'll be a little bit more specific about our definition of heart disease. Second, why is it important? Pro probably an obvious question, maybe not. We'll go over some surprising or maybe not surprising statistics about the status of heart disease in this country and then worldwide. Third is know your numbers. We're gonna talk a lot about cardiovascular risk factors, how to monitor those, and then how to prevent those risk factors from occurring in the first place. I'd also, because I have a clinical interest in cardiovascular health in women, we'll discuss a little bit about how cardiovascular risk, risk factors are different in women. And lastly, some general kind of lifestyle tips so um, that you can follow at home to help minimize your risk of cardiovascular disease. 
So starting with question number one, what do we mean when we say heart disease? Um, and so I'm gonna start with a very basic anatomy lesson of the heart. And I think the reason that that's important is that obviously the heart is a vital structure. It pumps oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. Um, and so it's response, It's uh, also a quite complex structure. This is the, what the outside of the heart looks like and then the inside. And I like to break down this complex anatomy by kind of thinking of the heart in three big groups. The heart, like I said, is a pump that serves oxygenated, oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. And it's comprised of uh, electro electrical wires and valves. And because of the complexity of the heart structure, we know that any portion of the heart can become dysfunctional over time and cause health problems. But in general, when we're talking about heart disease, most often we're referring to coronary artery disease, which are the blood vessels, which are the blood vessels that sit on top of the heart surface and serve blood directly to the heart muscle. Zooming in a little bit more on these coronary arteries, specifically we're talking about the development of blockages or cholesterol plaques in the coronary arteries. You can see the progression of coronary artery disease across the screen here. Over time, with we know that cholesterol plaques composed of cholesterol and then fatty deposits can cause an obstruction to the blood flow through the coronary arteries and obstruct blood flow to the heart. When that occurs slowly over time, we call that coronary artery disease. If that, occur, if that obstruction occurs quickly where, or, or one of these blockages breaks open and stops the blood flow to the heart, that's one type of heart attack. So now that we've kind of defined what exactly is heart disease, why is it important? I think we kind of generally know this, but it affects a lot of people, not only here at home in the US, but also worldwide. It's the number one cause of death in the US across all racial, racial, ethnic, and gender groups. So that accounts for about one in every five deaths in this country. And I think a sort of surprising to st statistics to hear is that someone has a heart attack in this country every 40 seconds, which tells us that this is a significant burden of disease in this country. Expanding the scope and looking a little bit more worldwide, 17.9 million people died from cardiovascular disease in 2019 around the world. So it's a disease with a high degree of prevalence, but the reason we bring it up is that it has a lot of things that we can do to prevent its occurrence. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to include, 85% of those cardiovascular deaths worldwide are related to heart attack or to stroke. Separately from the risk of death that comes from heart disease, we also know that it affects the quality of life. We know that heart disease causes symptoms, things like shortness of breath, chest pain, which is also called angina, or difficulty with exercise, exercise intolerance. We also know that coronary artery disease can set the heart up for other, other types of heart problems, things like heart failure, which is failure of the heart muscle to pump, or arrhythmia or electrical disorders of the heart. So given how, how prevalent this disease is, we know that prevention is absolutely key. So kind of moving on to the next phase of our talk, we will talk a lot about the importance of knowing your numbers and understanding what your risk factors are for cardiovascular disease. I really like this infographic from the American Heart Association where it breaks down cardiovascular risk factors and cardiovascular risk prevention um, into kind of eight basic categories. When we're talking about the numbers specifically, we're actually talking about the bottom half of that circle there. The first number that you need to be aware of is your blood pressure. The disease that has elevated blood pressure is called hypertension and that's signified by the little purple part, portion of the circle. Another risk factor um, you need to be aware of is hyperlipidemia or elevated cholesterol levels. Next, diabetes or elevated blood sugar, which also contributes to heart disease. Smoking or the use of tobacco products also um, is an, uh, another heart risk factor. And then one that's not actually included in the infographic that I think is important for you to be aware of and then share with your uh, doctors or your providers is if there's any family history of premature coronary artery disease. What that means is if there's mem members of the family, particularly first degree relatives, so 
parents, siblings who had a history of coronary artery disease diagnosed at an early age. For men, for men, that's below the age of 55, and for women, that's below the age of 60. So if you have any relatives um, that fall into that category, that'd be something important to share with your doctors. So going into a little bit more information about these cardiovascular risk factors. First, blood pressure. So quick question, true or false? I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. Um, high blood pressure can often be a silent disease and have no signs or symptoms. This is true. Um, so high blood pressure, often referred to as the silent killer. And I think that's obviously a little bit morbid to kind of think about it that way. But we do know that elevated blood pressure increases the risk of stroke and heart disease, uh, heart disease and kidney disease without necessarily causing any outward symptoms, which is why it's very important to track your blood pressure and treat it if it's starting to become elevated. This is what a, whole, what a blood pressure monitor uh, device looks like. You'll see ones in the doctor's office and they can also be purchased for monitoring your blood pressure at home. When you're monitoring blood pressure, it's comprised of two different numbers. You get two different, different numbers back on the monitor. The first is called the systolic pressure, which is the top number, and the bottom number is called diastolic pressure. That top number, your systolic pressure, this is the pressure in your blood vessels when your heart's contracting. And then diastolic pressure is the pressure that's in your blood vessels between the heartbeats. And it's important to understand and know both of those numbers. Tips for monitoring blood pressure. With how common blood pressure devices have become and how easily available they are, I think there's a few important tips you need to know for how to monitor your blood pressure accurately at home. The first is when you sit down to take your blood pressure, make sure that you're still. If, think, if you've been walking, exercising, you know, moving around a lot, and then sit down and check your blood pressure right away, we know that it's going to be elevated. So we wanna make sure that when you sit down to check your blood pressure, you've been sitting for at least about two minutes before you press the button to check your blood pressure. Second is to not use the cuff over, over your clothing. Make sure that you have the cuff on your bare skin before you um, inflate the device. Like I said, don't check blood pressure for about 30 minutes after exercise because we know that blood pressure should escalate during exercise and we wanna get an accurate assessment of what your true resting blood pressure is. Next, make sure to take about two or even three readings in a row. And the reason, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, if you haven't relaxed properly, that first reading can often come back elevated. And sometimes I think we, come, we become nervous about what that blood pressure reading is going to look like. And that can also cause the blood pressure to be falsely elevated. And I guess I would add a third as well is that those cuffs can get quite tight. And with the pain response can also come a falsely elevated reading. So what I ask all of my patients is to check your blood pressure a second time before you even get up um, or even a third time and to track what all of those blood pressure readings are. You wanna make sure that the blood pressure cuff that you're using fits appropriately over your arm. A blood pressure cuff that's too small or too large can give you inaccurate readings. In general, you wanna make sure that you can slip about two, you, when you put the blood pressure cuff on, can slip about two fingers comfortably into the cuff, but, um, that, um, comfortably but snug um, before you uh, cycle your blood pressure. And lastly, keep a record of your blood pressures to review with your doctor. Blood pressure is about patterns, and so we don't, you don't wanna make a significant judgment off an isolated reading, but keeping a track of what your pattern is doing at home will be helpful information and make your doctor's appointment very productive. So you, can, you collect all of the information about what your blood pressure numbers are. The question now is, what does that mean? Um, so this uh, graphic here is depicting the most recent US guidelines for determining high blood pressure. I think if you look at the numbers, you'll be a little bit, you might be a little bit surprised to see that blood pressure targets, what's defined as normal, has actually changed a little bit in the last few years. And I think the reason is because we are in general under uh, treating and not picking up enough high blood pressure. And because of this, we know that we need to be more aggressive with screening and therefore treating for elevated blood pressure. 
So normal blood pressure is considered less than 120 over 80. We consider it elevated when it's in that 120 to 129 over 80 range. Then we start making a diagnosis of stage one hypertension at 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. And then stage two hypertension is now defined as 140 or 90 over high, uh, um, or higher. Um, the other thing I would like to just point out is at the bottom here where you need, what blood pressure ratings do you need to consider reaching out to your doctor? And that's with, with a systolic or top blood pressure reading of 180 uh, with, and with a diastolic reading of 120 it would be a time that you consult your doctor um, about uh, the blood pressure escalation. A little bit about how to manage blood pressure. So we know that there are some significant lifestyle adjustments that can be made to start bringing down your blood pressure readings if we're picking up a pattern of elevation. The first is to target a little bit of weight loss. We know that maintaining normal healthy weights can help bring um, can help moderate your blood pressure. And for those who are overweight, we can if with bringing with weight loss can also expect to see some improvement in systolic uh, pressures by about two to five millimeters of mercury. The second recommendation is to follow a DASH diet. This is a diet that incorporates a lot of fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy, less sodium, um, and can with those dietary changes can expect to see about a three to 11 point reduction in your systolic pressure. Reducing salt or sodium intake in the diet. It's a tough one to uh, make changes to because sodium is so prevalent in our um, processed foods, but if you are cooking at home and have some level of control of the salt that you're adding to your food, minimizing your salt can also help bring your blood pressure down. To that point, also increasing sources of potassium in the diet, getting plenty of fruit and vegetables is also known to help bring down your blood pressure. Physical activity, we'll talk this a about this a little bit later in, um, in today's lecture, but physical activity is also a great way to start bringing down your blood pressure. Staying consistent with about 90 to 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week can also, when practiced consistently, can also start bringing down your blood pressure. Um, and then last is to limit alcohol use. So for men, that's less than two drinks per day. For women, that's less than one drink per day. Can also help uh, bring down your blood pressure by about three to four points as well. That being said, the lifestyle changes can get us to a point, but depending on the elevation of your blood pressure, medications are often required as a helpful adjunct to lifestyle measures for bringing down and managing your blood pressure. I will say that it's not unusual to use one, you know, a couple of medications in combination um, with each other uh, to start bringing down the blood pressure, particularly if it's quite elevated and significant reduction is required. I encourage all of my patients that when you're talking about starting any sort of medication with your doctor, I, you sh routinely should ask about the side effects of the medication, but I would always also encourage you to ask about secondary benefits, particularly with blood pressure medication. A lot of blood pressure medications that we use also have protective effects on the kidneys or other structures in the heart. So it's never, uh, it always helps to ask your doctor if there's, um, you know, why they're picking a particular medication regimen for in your case. As always, talk to your doctor about what your blood pressure target should be and, you know, discuss with them about the strategies that can best be used between lifestyle modification and then blood pressure uh, pharmacologic medication to bring down your blood pressure. The next number that is extremely important for you to know is your cholesterol. So quick quiz here, fact or fiction, high cholesterol is only caused by an unhealthy diet. And the answer to that is that it's actually fiction. Um, and the key word in there is only. We know that there are rare, but certain types of genetic disorders that can also predispose us to high cholesterol. For the vast majority, it is can be related to lifestyle factors such as unhealthy diet, but there can be a genetic component as well. So when we're talking about cholesterol, what exactly is it? Well, it's a waxy fat-like substance that circulates in the blood and it gets deposited in the walls of the blood vessel, which is what, what causes plaques or obstructions to, flow, to form. When we obstruct blood flow to the heart, 
that's when we start developing heart disease or coronary artery disease. We track cholesterol levels by a blood test. It's called a lipid panel. When you get back a lipid panel with your, um, as part of your results from blood work, um, there's a couple of important numbers to be aware of. The first is your total cholesterol. Um, the second is your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol. Third, cholesterol, third number is your HDL cholesterol, which is considered your good cholesterol. And then triglycerides. This is a measure of um, fatty acids in the blood, sugar breakdown products. Um, and so the total cholesterol you can see here is a summation of the LDL bad cholesterol, HDL good cholesterol, and then about 20% of your triglyceride levels. In general, when we're trying to reduce your cholesterol, the big thing to monitor is sources of fat that are coming in with the diet. In general, we want to be doing less of the saturated or trans fat, replacing or prioritizing sources of mono or unsaturated fats. Example of the, examples of these. So when we're talking about healthy fats, we're talking about things like avocado, salmon, raw unsalted nuts, um, almond and peanut butters, flax and pumpkin seeds are also a good source of healthy fats. Um, and then liquid oils, so cooking with things like canola or olive oil. Sources of unhealthy fats, um, so tends to be things like fatty or processed meats. Think hamburgers, bacon, hot dogs, things of that nature. Um, full fat dairy can also be a source of unhealthy fat in the diet, as well as solid fats, butter, lard, coconut oil, or palm oil. And then we don't wanna lose sight of the triglycerides. So ways to minimize the triglycerides if you find that your um, number is elevated on your blood panel. The first is to minimize sources of alcohol. Um, second, avoiding refined sugars. Third, minimizing excess calories, particularly from the fats like we talked about before. Um, minimizing sources of simple carbohydrates. So that's things like white, uh, white bread, pasta, and potatoes. Um, and then pr instead, prioritizing sources of fiber-rich carbohydrates. So those are things like vegetables and whole grains. Increasing your source of omega-3 fatty acids can also be good in bringing down your triglyceride levels. So that, that comes from sources like fish, fish oil, or flax seeds. So a couple of key points about your cholesterol. Um, first, I would advise you, when you get your cholesterol panel back, ask your doctor about what your cholesterol levels should be based on your medical history. In general, LDLs should be ideally about 100 or less, and then triglycerides about 140 or less. Um, and those would be considered ideal. But that being said, normal can vary based on your medical history. So I'd encourage you to talk to your doctor about what your target should be, and then making lifestyle adjustments appropriately. Medications are also a very helpful adjunct to any diet changes that you're making. I will say that in treating cholesterol, statins are the most common medications. I know that there's a lot out there in the popular culture about statin medications, um, side effects, things of that nature. My strong encouragement would be to talk to your doctor about any concerns you have about being on cholesterol medication, review the side effects, and then ask if there's alternatives to, treat, to treating your cholesterol as well. The third one about knowing the, import the importance of knowing your number is I would argue is your blood sugar. So last quiz, true or false? My body weight is normal, therefore I cannot get diabetes. And the answer to that is actually false. So we do know that yes, obesity is a risk factor for di type two diabetes, but there are a lot of other things that contribute to, to the risk of developing diabetes. Family history is one. Seconds can be things like fat distribution or um, within the body. Other medical conditions like PCOS can also can, uh, increase the risk of diabetes over time. So diabetes risk can exist regardless of uh, the BMI or body, uh, or body weight. So blood sugar, how does it become elevated? Basically, we get blood sugar elevations when there's an inability to process sugar into energy for two reasons. One, if the body fails to utilize insulin correctly, or second, if the pancreas is not making enough insulin. 
we break down um, elevated blood sugar into two categories. The first is prediabetes or impaired fasting glucose. And that's when you get a fasting blood glucose of 100 to 126 or a hemoglobin A1C greater than 5.7. Then the, the next stage of blood sugar elevation is what we call diabetes. And that's when you have a fasting blood sugar of 126 or hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5. Some lifestyle measures you can take to start moderating your blood sugar if you find out that yours might be elevated is through the diet. Minimizing sources of carbohydrate or sources of sugar in the diet will start bringing down your blood sugar. We also know exercising regularly has a lot of benefits to lowering the blood sugar and managing diabetes. Specifically, it helps with managing the weight. And secondly, it also helps you utilize sugar. The third is medications. There's a lot of different strategies that we can use to minimize or treat prediabetes or diabetes. Lifestyle is one, but for oftentimes for people, we are using medications to help aid with that process. Medications can come sometimes in the form of oral medications like pills, and sometimes we have to use insulin to help moderate the blood sugar as well. So this is a little bit about cardiovascular risk factors um, um, and how to manage those. I was gonna pause here for questions, Kate. I'm happy to keep going um, and kind of get through the next couple of slides as well. Actually, we do have one um, that I think would be good to address now if you don't mind. Sure. Um, one of our audience members um, commented that you, you know, you mentioned LDL cholesterol numbers, but um, this yeah. person's understanding is that, I don't know how you say it, a, a pop or APOB particle count is a better indicator of heart disease. And if that's true, um, why don't we measure that regularly? Yeah, so APOB, APOB is a, um, a particle that gets attached to your LDL cholesterol and your triglycerides. So you're correct, ABLE-B is a great way to understand your uh, cardiovascular risk. It has a, It's one that's coming into greater understanding and right now is not part of a traditional lipid panel. Um, and so that's why it's not something that's monitored regularly. But for people that we are looking for additional cardiovascular risk reduction, it can be a very helpful tool. So I think that it's going to start you know, um, working its way um, into blood work more often. It is a great way to track cardiovascular risk and it's a summation of your, L, your all of your atherogenic particles, your L, uh, LDL and then to some degree uh, uh, VLDL as well. Um, uh, but it's not part of the routine lipid panel right now, but maybe one day will be, but it is a great way to track your um, cardiovascular risk. Excellent, thank you. Absolutely. I see your slide. Did you know your slides are moving? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I tried to catch back up to where we were. So. Yeah, oh, okay, okay, good. Gotcha. So, there we go. Perfect. Um, okay, so I'm going to take a break from cardiovascular risk factors, and I just want to talk a little bit about women's cardiovascular health. Um, and so the reason that we kind of have bring, been bringing a lot of attention to this is um, for a couple of reasons. I think number one is that for years, for you know, decades, the focus of when, uh, women's health, when you talk about women's health, had strictly a reproductive focus only. And over years, you know, thinking as of heart disease as strictly um, occurring in men, it led to a couple of things. First being women un being underrepresented in clinical trials. So there's a lack of uh, understanding about the um, coronary artery disease or heart disease in women. Second is that we also know is that um, in women, traditional heart uh, risk factors such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or diabetes have tended to be managed less aggressively. We don't really know why there's a thought, could it be because people experience more side effects from medications? Um, not really sure why, but the data has shown us that in general, for some reason, we have tended to treat those risk factors a little bit less aggressively in women. Um, and then lastly, is that we also know that women have had poorer outcomes after a heart attack. There's an increased risk of hospitalization or even death after a heart attack. And so that's led to a lot of um, public health efforts or awareness. Um, you might have seen this kind of go red for women. In 2004, the American Heart Association de designated the first Friday in February as Women's Heart, uh, Women's heart Day or Heart Health Awareness, um, really to bring attention to, uh, to heart disease in women for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, women, heart disease is the number one killer of women. That's one in every five women that will die from heart, cardiovascular disease. 
And the bigger problem is that women underestimate the risk of heart disease. Uh, of heart disease. We know that when surveys that have been conducted, we ask women, what, what do you understand to be the biggest risk factor to your health? Most women will point out that cancer and specifically breast cancer is the biggest risk to their health. And we know that that's not true. The second thing is that, you know, the reason that we've been brought up a lot about women's heart health is that women also have unique heart uh, risk factors for heart disease. We have all of the same traditional high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes to be aware of, but there are some risk factors that are unique to women um, that also contribute to cardiovascular disease. Those include things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, pregnancy complications, so things like gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, or peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is a type of heart failure that can occur during pregnancy. And then early onset menopause. So we know that for women who experience menopause before the age of 40, there's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease over the course of their lifetime. And the presence of these risk factors can really increase the risk of heart disease up to 30 to 60% later in life. Now, a word of caution here is that yes, we are talking in general about a low risk population. So increasing the risk um, you know, from low to from low to medium, but important risk factors to be aware of. The other thing that we, the other distinction to kind of be made about women's cardiovascular health is women experience unique symptoms from heart disease. We do know that particularly at the time of a heart attack, women can experience the same symptoms as men do, chest pain, shortness of breath, jaw, neck, or back pain. Nausea and vomiting can sometimes also be a presentation for heart disease or heart attack. But then women can also experience things like, or are more likely to experience things like indigestion, fainting, or extreme fatigue. And so this is another reason that there have been a lot of public health efforts to increase the awareness about not only the presence of cardiovascular disease in women, but that the presentation can also be um, atypical or different from than it would be in men. And so just a couple of key points to make about cardiovascular disease in women. I would argue, I would tell um, all of my patients, don't put off evaluation just because you believe you're at low risk. See your doctor, get your blood tests, and know your numbers. Um, I would also be encourage you to share with your doctor your history with pregnancy and menopause, um, especially because we know that those things can escalate the risk of heart disease. It's important for your doctor to know if those risk factors are pregnant uh, are present so that they can monitor and treat accordingly. Um, and lastly, be aware of the symptoms. Yes, we do also experience the chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting, but fatigue, lightheadedness, or indigestion can sometimes be unusual symptoms, um, and so to be on the lookout for those as well. And so um, I, what I wanted to do next is move into kind of the last part of our presentation, some lifestyle tips for prevention. Uh, I wanted to pick out kind of the, the ones that I think are unique or that I get asked about often in the office. So circling back to this infographic, talking about Life's Essential Eight, we'll talk about some of the ones that are included in that slide, but then some unique ones as well. Um, so the first one I think we all probably are aware of is the risk of smoking. Um, big advice would be if you don't smoke, don't start. Um, if you are already smoking, I would encourage you to seek medical help when you're ready to quit. There's a lot of tools, medications, things like that, that we can use to help you quit. Um, and the reason to consider quitting is because we, if you look at the chart on the right here, we know that there's benefit to be derived from the longer you can stay away from the cigarettes. Those benefits start really quickly. You can see within minutes, we can start seeing the heart rate coming down. Within the first couple of years, the risk of heart attack as a result of smoking goes down. Next few years, we also know that the coronary artery disease risk drops by about half. And then if you can be abstinent from cigarettes for about 15 years, your cardiovascular risk approaches background risk, meaning that you have the same risk factors as someone who doesn't smoke. The last thing I'd like to point out about smoking is actually e-cigarettes. This is something we get asked about quite a bit in the office. E-cigarettes, even, even the nicotine-free versions, do have some health risk because you're putting a foreign substance into your body where it doesn't belong. That being said, e-cigarettes can sometimes be a helpful tool 
for people who are already smoking and wanting to quit. Um, so it's something that I would talk to your doctor about if you're planning on quitting smoking or thinking about quitting smoking. The next part of cardiovascular risk prevention is the importance of sleep. Um, so we know that getting a good amount of sleep and good quality of sleep is actually one of the great ways to moderate your cardiovascular risk. The target for adults should be somewhere between seven to nine hours. Um, and we know that poor quality, poor quality sleep um, can increase the risk of not only cardiovascular disease, but of cognitive decline or dementia, can increase the risk of depression, and then it also increases the risk of blood pressure and blood sugar. Some strategies you can use to improve the quality of your sleep. Um, exercising regularly. So regular exercise is very great in helping you fall asleep at night, but I would avoid it for about two hours before going to bed. Um, oh, and I apologize there. I meant to put consistent bedtime on, a sec on the second line there, but having a, a specified time at which you go to bed every night can also help improve the regularity and quality of your sleep. Minimizing alcohol, particularly before bedtime, can uh, also improve the quality of your sleep. Avoiding caffeine in the afternoon. Um, and then the use of electronics. So this comes up a lot when we're talking about sleep hygiene or quality of sleep. Blocking notifications, keeping electronics far from the bed can also decrease the temptation to use those uh, in the middle of the night. Using dimmers or filters um, to filter out the blue light in your electronic devices can also be helpful towards improving the quality of your sleep. Um, the, on the topic of sleep, I also just wanted to put in a few words about sleep apnea. I think it's a common a condition that we've all heard a lot about. And basically what it is, it's a sleep disorder um, during which while you're sleeping, your breathing briefly stops. Um, sometimes those pauses in your breathing can last a short 10 to 20 seconds, but it can happen frequently while you're sleeping. And the reason that you would be surprised that, you know, why we talk about sleep apnea so often in the cardiology office is that it's linked to conditions like high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, sudden cardiac death, and heart failure. And so signs or symptoms for you to be aware of, um, of sleep apnea would include loud snoring, gasping for breath during sleep, uh, if you're waking up frequently in the middle of the night. Other symptoms can include things like morning headache, dry mouth, feeling irritable or tired or distracted during the day, or excessive daytime sleepiness. If you're experiencing these symptoms, I would encourage you to speak with your cardiologist or to your doctor about um, the fact that you're having these symptoms and that you might need to be evaluated for sleep apnea. Some of the basic measures we use to treat sleep apnea include weight loss. We do um, Losing weight can, can be helpful towards managing sleep apnea. Um, avoiding alcohol or other medications that can disrupt your sleep pattern or the quality of your sleep. Maintaining some of those healthy sleep hygiene habits that we just discussed can also um, decrease uh, the risk from sleep apnea. And sometimes we can talk, we, your doctor will recommend things like sleeping devices, uh, breathing devices while you sleep. So things like CPAPs or BiPAPs um, to help moderate your breathing while you're sleeping. Surgical procedures can also be per performed uh, to treat sleep apnea. Um, and then, Switching gears a little bit from the quality of sleep is kind of the next lifestyle modification that comes up often in managing cardiovascular risk is the role of exercise. And specifically, we're talking about aerobic exercise. Um, and what do we mean by aerobic exercise? Well, uh, the medical definition is the use of large muscle groups that can be, tamed, that can be maintained continuously and rhythmically in nature. Um, layman's, we're talking about activities that gets your heart rate up, things like brisk walking or jogging, water aerobics or swimming. Cycling can all be great e examples of aerobic exercise. Um, how much exercise do we need to be shooting for? So for aerobic exercise, we're looking at about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise. And again, this is just aerobic exercise for cardiovascular benefit. We know that aerobic exercise is part of you know, a robust exercise plan. We also wanna be focusing on muscle strengthening exercises, flexibility exercises, and balance as well. And then a general get, and remember, these are general guidelines about the time that you need to be uh, shooting for per week. 
um, you're going to be adjusting these times based on your medical history and any physical limitations you might have. So what do we mean by uh, you know, a moderate intensity exercise? So 150 minutes can be broken up 30 minutes five times a week quite easily. These are the level of exercise that raise your heart rate and cause you to break a sweat. Um, but it's, it's something that you can still kind of talk or converse through. Singing would be difficult, but you can still have a conversation or get, a few, get some words out while you're exercising. For people who are using heart rate tracking devices, the Fitbit, Apple Watch, things of that nature have become really popular. This falls to about 64 to 76% of your maximum predicted heart rate. For vigorous exercise, that we're talking about um, higher intensity exercise. So generally, you can use that breath test again. Difficult to say more than a few words while you're exercising when you're going for vigorous intensity exercise. So looks like things like jogging, running, things of that nature. For people who are using the heart rate tracking devices, that's 77 to 93% of your maximum predicted heart rate. And so for people who are using, you know, Apple Watch, Fitbit, things like that, uh, to monitor their heart rate, um, the way we do that calculation is calcul to calculate your maximum predicted heart rate is 220 minus your age, and that's your maximum predicted heart rate. When you're doing moderate intensity exercise, that's about 60, 64 to 76% of your maximum predicted heart rate. And then again, vigorous 77 to 93%. Um, and then a word of caution, because I feel like this comes up very frequently in the office, is that each heart rate monitor is designed differently and everyone has their limitations. And so I would discuss with your doctor about any questions or concerns that you might have about wearable technology that you're using at home. I think for heart rates, you know, it can be a helpful um, way to monitor while you're exercising, but there are limitations if you're looking for other types of cardiovascular monitoring from your heart rate, um, from your wearable technology. Um, and then one that's not necessarily included in the healthy eight, but comes up quite frequently in the office in terms of lifestyle prevention is the role of aspirin. Um, you probably remember from a few years ago, there were a bunch of news articles that kind of suggested that we don't necessarily need aspirin anymore for our um, cardiovascular health. I think this resulted in a bunch of questions, confusion, a bunch of phone calls about do or do I not need to be on aspirin? And really the short answer to that question is that it boils down to the benefit versus risk of you being on an aspirin. In general, aspirin has a very strong um, role and indication in people who have had evidence of a prior heart attack, who have cardiovascular stents, or certain types of strokes. The news article came out because there was there's a thought that for older adults who've never had a history of heart attack or stroke, the risk of bleeding on aspirin needs to be considered against any sort of benefit we might be discussing for deriving um, for cardiovascular risk reduction. So the short answer is is that it's complicated with aspirin. If you're already on an aspirin, I would speak I would encourage you to speak with your doctor about whether you should be someone who continues taking aspirin. And if you're not already on an aspirin, something to talk about with your doctor before you go ahead and start. Um, and then the last piece, piece of um, lifestyle advice, I would say during the month of February, since it's Heart Health Month, if you're looking for ways to kind of get involved or learn a little bit more, I would encourage you to take a CPR class, learn a little bit more about CPR. Really, things have gotten easier over time. It's only two simple steps to save a life. Step one, if you see someone who experiences cardiac arrest or, cardio, uh, or collapses, call 911. Um, and then the second is to learn how to do high quality chest compressions. And I put this in here just to kind of bring attention to the fact that I think a lot of people hesitate to perform or learn uh, CPR because they're concerned about performing mouth to mouth on someone else. Um, but really we know that hands only CPR can be highly effective in saving someone's life. And chest compressions is the number one thing that's going to ensure um, someone's survival after cardiac, uh, cardiac arrest. And so I'd encourage you during the month of February, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, learn hands-only CPR. Um, and then just to kind of um, give you a little bit more information, so about our cardiovascular practice. So if you're interested in speaking with someone or learning a little bit more about your cardiovascular risk factors, um, this is our 
our VHC cardiology group has grown a lot in the last couple of years. Um, we're now nine cardiologists and six advanced practice providers and have a, a variety of locations. We're located in the new outpatient pavilion here on the VHC Arlington campus, um, but we also see patients in Old Town Alexandria, in Tyson's, and then now also in the Kingston, uh, Kingstown office. And so I'd encourage you, if you have questions, concerns, anything you'd like to discuss, you can go ahead and schedule an appointment here online or give our office a call. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, your time and your attention uh, for today's presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinwell. That was wonderful. I think you really nicely laid out for our audience the measurements that they should be looking at in terms of knowing their numbers and preparing people to go in and talk to their provider if necessary. So I'm sure people hopefully walking away with more information as well as some good questions to take into the office if next time. And also, of course, those lifestyle changes, we hear them a lot, but it's always good to break it down and you added in a few more that are in the typical um, presentation. So thank you so much for really fleshing things out for us. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't chime in and say that our department here, Senior Health at the hospital, we actually have a couple programs that directly link to some of those lifestyle changes you mentioned. So I just wanna put in a quick plug for those. Um, we have a free walking program, a weekly walking program here at Lubber Run Community Center in Arlington. Encourage folks to come out, walk the track with us at your own pace. There's a free um, stretching session at the end that's led by our staff here in the senior health department. And we also provide um, free blood pressure screening at each of those um, walks. So that's Thursday mornings. And if anyone's interested, you can reach out to me in the senior health department. I can get you more information. And then our department also offers a lot, a variety of um, exercise classes around the, the area, around the community um, geared towards older adults. And some are really gentle, easygoing. Others are a little more aerobic. So again, if you're looking to kind of address some of those lifestyle changes those are just a couple ideas for everyone so with that plug let me just turn to the questions real quick um, and see what we've got here there was one earlier i think it connected back to your comments around cholesterol and i think they were okay. thinking some clarification maybe you mentioned a new type of cholesterol measure i don't know if it's referred to as a or if this, the audience member may have been trying to recall what you said she said, what was the new type of cholesterol measure? A, capital A. Does that ring a bell at all in terms of the comments you made earlier? Oh, um, I actually, I don't think it was involved in this presentation, but there's, I think they might be referring to one of two things, but I suspect they're referring to uh, another kind of uh, blood test that we do called lipoprotein A, um, which is another lipoprotein that's tracked in the blood that we know when present or when elevated can really increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, it's thought to be kind of sick, quite atherogenic, um, even compared to LDL cholesterol. The way it stands right now, we don't actually have, um, you know, a treatment that's been FDA approved for lowering or, um, uh, or treating elevated lipoprotein A. Um, but it's something that we still check for, particularly because we know that it's something that can run in families and, and is a genetic marker for uh, coronary artery disease. Um, and so it's a part of a routine uh, blood test that we, we check when there's a family history of premature coronary artery disease or believe that someone's at elevated risk for coronary artery disease um, and use it to say, well, when we find that it's elevated, you know, make sure that we control the other risk factors um, very strongly. So making sure that we're getting blood pressure, blood sugar, and, and LDL cholesterol to target. But that one, I think they might be asking about lipoprotein A, that genetic marker. Gotcha, thank you. Another question um, that says, I've read that um, an NSAIDs, or how do you, is that, I don't know if it's N <laughs> NSAIDs, uh -huh. NSAIDs? Yeah, NSAIDs, yeah. Yep, can increase risk of cardiovascular risk. Can you speak to this? Yes, um, consistent use of, the, of, of that ca class of medication. So when we're talking about things like NSAIDs, those are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, so those are um, pain medic typically pain medications like um, uh, meloxicam, uh, Motrin or ibuprofen, um, naproxen or medications like Aleve. Um, we know that they can increase the risk of heart disease, um, particularly in patients who've had a prior heart attack and particularly with consistent use. We also know that with consistent use of things like uh, of medications like NSAID can also um, increase 
blood pressure as well, um, and can also interact with their other medications. And so, yes, we do know that with consistent use of the NSAIDs, there can be an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, not to say that we can't use them safely, but you wanna be cautious, particularly if you've had a prior history of heart attack. That's something that you definitely wanna discuss with your doctor. Great. All right, one more, one more question that I'm seeing here. Um, <laughs> So with all the available tools we have around, you know, knowing about your diet, exercise, good sleep habits, medicine, um, this question gets to, is it, is, is it preventable? I mean, is it um, for, the mo for the most part, despite its prevalence? So maybe that speaks to the genetics piece of it. And, and maybe you can address like people doing all of these great lifestyle changes, but we still see a high percentage of people experiencing heart disease. Yes, and so um, it can feel overwhelming when you talk about all of these different types of lifestyle interventions that need to be undertaken to reduce the risk of heart disease. I think um, it's about reducing the risk, right? And so for people who are at elevated risk, those lifestyle measures help reduce the risk. We know that heart disease can still happen. Age is a, is a big risk factor for heart disease um, to develop. And we know that we can prevent or at least delay the progression of any type of atherosclerotic or coronary artery disease. So that's why there's so much emphasis on the lifestyle um, adjustments, the medications, is because our hope is to slow and maybe even prevent, um, particular, you know, pre pre to prevent heart disease. But we can't, yeah, we can very much reduce reduce the risk for sure. That's great. I think that, yeah. Good. Um, here's a question. Is an irregular heartbeat considered a type of heart disease? So irregular heartbeats actually referring to things like arrhythmias. And so um, that has to do more with the electrical system of the heart as opposed to the blood supply to the heart. Um, so kind of two different things. Got this. Okay, great. Um, well, I just want to let you know, we've been getting many comments in from folks saying thank you so much for the presentation, especially folks appreciated you hitting on some of those women, uh, the issues affecting women. So that's great. Um, and I did want to remind our audience that there is a recording of this presentation and I will be sending that out um, next week, um, early next week. It takes a, a day to process. So um, everybody should expect to get that in case you want to review the presentation again. Um, great. Um, and I will also include the um, contact information for your office as well as the other offices if, if they're interested in follow up. So again, Dr. Sindel, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm sure you have a busy month with <laughs> different presentations throughout the community. So we really appreciate that you were here with us. And I wanna thank our audience as well for joining us on this somewhat dreary Friday. Um, hopefully it'll look nice over the weekend. And let me put in a, a mention of our presentation next month. Our Healthy Aging Lecture is gonna focus on nutrition. And a reminder and, or a notice that it's gonna actually be an in-person presentation that we're gonna do at Arlington uh, Central Library. And it's gonna focus on uh, holistic eating. We're gonna have two dietitians join us to give a kind of an interactive talk as well as a cooking demonstration. And you should be able to go home with some healthy uh, recipes to prepare for yourself. Um, so if you're interested in that, again, reach out to our office to register. It's of course a free, um, in-person presentation at the Arlington County Central Library. And that will be on March 15th at 2 p.m. So with that, I'm going to um, close out the meeting and wish everybody a very happy uh, weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.